Hello, welcome back to the studio. Well, as you can see, there's just a blank canvas behind me. If you've watched any of my videos, you'll know that I do a lot of painting. I paint every week for you. But there are times when, well, the inspiration just isn't there. You find yourself looking at a blank canvas, paintbrush in hand, wondering, what next? This is very common. We sort of run out of steam on something. We can't just sort of find it in ourselves to come up with something that we really want to do. It's particularly common when you paint a lot, like I do. You sort of think to yourself, what could I possibly bring to the table next time? My solution is to go back to basics. Find a painting which has inspired you in the past. Paint that. It'll give you that sort of rush of adrenaline and get you to paint something else. One of my particular favourites is this Bob Ross classic, Twilight Beauty. I've painted it many times and I love it every single time. The funny thing is, I set out to do this painting for inspiration and ended up doing something completely different. Painting is a roller coaster of emotions. We don't always know where we're going to end up. And with that, let's get on with the painting. And I'm going to call it Spring Mist. At least I think it's Spring Mist. We'll see. So here's my canvas. It's 16 inches by 20. And you can see here, I've put a couple of map pins in the side of my canvas. I simply measured from the top of the canvas using a Bob Ross one inch landscape brush. This will give me the horizon line. Today, I'm going to be using some black gesso, but you could use acrylic as well. I've put some out on a plate and I'm going to use this small foam brush. Something with a reasonably good chiseled edge is what we're looking for. I'm going to mark the horizon line with a little bit of a dip in the center. I want this to be sort of an interesting shape, not just dead straight. Now, let's put in a few little markers. I like to plan my paintings a little ahead. There might be a tree on this left side, so I won't bother going all the way over. Notice here how I tap using the foam brush to just get the edge to skid a little bit. These want to be sort of slightly softened. As I mentioned, I won't bother putting too many big ones here on the left side. I continue tapping, just sort of filling in roughly here and there. Some of these trees want a little bit more definition though. I'll make this one a little stronger and use just the corner of the foam brush and just tap. I want to create some little fir trees. There, that wasn't too hard. I think I'll give him a little friend. As you see, I've done quite a number of them. I want my painting to look like a lovely forest. You'll also notice that I've grouped them together and I've left one all on its own. He's got a special job. Pay special attention to some of these background trees. They're not so solid. I let them fade away a little bit. We'll see what happens to those in a moment. I leave my painting to dry for at least 20 minutes. I run my hand over the painting to make sure it's completely dry before putting on some oils. Today I'm using this Bob Ross liquid white oil paint. But liquid white? Don't you mean liquid clear? No, I say, this is all about smoke and mirrors, a magic trick. I've got a small amount of the liquid white in a pot and I'm using an old Bob Ross one inch landscape brush. And I want to cover the background with a thin, even coat. As you know, white paint tends to be opaque. In other words, you can't see through it. But watch, if you scrub it on very thinly, you create misty effects. It's like magic. You can make things disappear and reappear, just like a magician. I want to use this brush again, but it's full of liquid white. So give it a good dry clean first on some paper towel. There. Now let's have a look at my palette. As you see, I've put out some of my colors and there are a few still to come. But the first color I'm going to use is this one, Indian yellow. It's a sort of transparent yellow color. I'm going to use that same brush again and rub a little bit into the bristles and see what the effect is of painting over the top of these little distant trees. As you see, it's a transparent yellow color. I can still see those little distant trees. 
More magic, you say? Yes, I say. As you paint over the black gesso, they slowly turn green. What is this? Painting alchemy? Yes, it is. Playing around with acrylics and gessos and transparent colours creates all sorts of special effects. Don't forget, let's add some water by pulling in edge to centre. I'll do edge to centre from this side as well. By doing this, you avoid putting a hard mark across the centre of your water. But I don't mind there being some streaks of light and dark. It looks more natural, I think. But what about this? What can I do with this area? I think there's a chance of doing some more mist with it. We'll see later on. I'm going to mix up a new colour. Indian yellow, bright red. This makes a warm carroty orange colour. There. I'm going to use this for my sky. Again, using that same old one inch brush. Let's go above the Indian yellow colour. Use little crisscross strokes to blend these together. I don't want a hard line. I want everything to be seamless, blending from one colour into another. I'll take this colour to the top of my canvas and again pull some in from the edges for the water. I leave a little bit of a light area here. Now for another new colour, alizarin crimson and a little touch of thalo blue. Mix these together to make a sort of lavender tone. I give it a good mix up and to test my colour I always use a little bit of titanium white. I think it's a little too crimson but let's carry on with it. I think it'll be okay. My final colour is a little bit of yellow ochre. This should be a nice blue grey colour by now but it's clearly not. But I'm not going to waste it. I'm still going to use it. Does that sound all too familiar? Yes, I'm afraid we're all prone to doing it. Making the wrong colour, cast a pie in face time, and yet we still carry on with it. This is the colour I should have made. With a little more blue and a little less alizarin crimson. This is a valuable lesson. If you've made the wrong colour, don't use it. Discard it. Put it to one side and use the right colour. I'm afraid I'm as guilty as the next person of ruining a perfectly good painting simply because I stubbornly refused to throw away the wrong colour. Here you see I'm using some of that nice blue-grey colour to tap in some distant clouds. I've almost got a hint of lavender to them. Here I've got a fresh dry brush and I'm going to just soften them out slightly. Just stroke along them gently create this lovely soft background sky in the right colour. I might still change my mind about it. We'll see. I think I got away with that pickle. Let's add a little touch of this down in the water as well. There. Time for tea. And a second opinion maybe. Yes. I think my background sky looks a little bit sort of, well, wishy-washy. A bit pale. I'll add some darker clouds. I want to draw my eye to one particular point in the painting. Here. I want a sunrise or a sunset. So a darker corner here and there really draws your eye in. Now for some more magic. Two new wands. Well, actually a brush and a cotton bud. I can just gently remove some of that Indian yellow colour and reveal the gesso trees underneath. You can scroll away as much or as little as you want. The more you remove, the more prominent they look, the closer they come to you in the painting. The lovely thing is, is if you take off too much, you can always rub it across with your finger, smudge it back in and tone them down again. Here you see I've created several layers of trees just by removing a little more of the liquid white Indian yellow colour. Let's give my painting a little sparkle. I've put some Indian yellow, titanium white on my finger and I've just tapped to the side of this tree. I told you it had a special job. It's about a third of the way in from the side of my canvas and it gives me a point of interest. I've even added a few little rays of light but I'm not sure I like them. It might be one special effect too many. I've tidied up my palette 
and I've taken my lavender color into the center and I'm going to add to it some more thalo blue, some black, Van Dyke brown, the remainder of my lizard crimson and a good dollop of sap green. I want a dark greenish tone for some mid ground. You see, I mix it well. I've gone back to my old one inch brush. I did give it a good dry clean. Notice how I press my brush down into the paint to make a little ridge. This adds a decent amount of paint to my brush, but also creates some texture. I tap my brush on the canvas to transfer the paint, again creating texture. This is important if we're going to make a highlight stick to it. As Bob would say, the dark colors are sticky and textured, and the highlight colors, yellows and greens, are thin and oily, and they want to stick to the textured surface. A thin paint sticks to a thick paint. Here you see I switch to a nice brush, and again I push into my highlight colors, thinner and oily. I get the paint to sit right on the edge of the brush. Watch carefully. Angle the brush slightly down. Tap gently. I transfer a little bit of color from just under the misty area down to the edge of the water. Always leave a little bit of a dark here and there. As you see, I changed my color up, got something a little brighter on the go. Once again, I tap directly under where I think the light would be brightest, just to the left of that tree. But take care when doing this, because one thin oily paint usually doesn't stick very well to another layer of oily paint. It only worked because I left a little dark. And that's a top tip. Leave some dark here and there. Painting's really coming together, but now it's time to stand back and make a change. The more I studied my painting, the more I realized the, the angle of the trees in the background didn't mirror the angle of the land in the foreground. No, I needed to make a change, but I didn't realize that until I stood back. And I think this looks much better. But now time for some little reflections. I'm gonna grab some of the color from the riverbank, but I'm going to leave a little gap. I want to do a reflection of the sun on the surface of the water. And to save me the hassle of trying to paint through all that dark, I leave a little notch. It's a useful little trick and one that you should consider using when you do your own version of this painting. I dry clean my brush thoroughly and brush edge to center again, lifting off with a little flourish. I want to just make some ripples on the water, but don't overwork it. It'll all become a big blur otherwise. Time to add the reflection of the sun on the water. For this, I got a filbert brush and I'm getting some of my off-white paint doesn't need to be perfectly clean for this stage. But I do load my brush well, because really, I've got one shot of this. So now hold your breath. And in one stroke. And breathe out. Sometimes you just have to, well, grit your teeth and go for it. Now, a few gentle brushes backwards and forwards to get a nice ripple effect going on the water. So here's my painting so far, and as you saw, using a black gesso or black acrylic for an underpainting opened a complete world of opportunities to come back and change things, to move things around, to completely alter the whole feel of the painting. That little bit of ground mist coming through there, it's a fabulous little feature. Was it a happy accident? Maybe. But I took advantage of the fact that there was something that I could do extra with my painting. I only realized that these little things are possible by taking a short sort of step away from your painting, maybe just for five or 10 minutes, have a lunch break, even sleep on it, and then come back and look at your painting again the following day. By giving yourself time to sit back and reflect on what you've done, you open the world of possibilities to what extra you can do to a painting. I hope you take more time to sit back from your paintings, especially in oils. It's one of the key features of using them. By the way, you notice I took away those rays of light 
I thought it was just one step too far from my painting, but who knows, I may put them back again. Let's carry on. I've gone back to my old brush, and once again into that dark green colour. This time notice I'm favouring one corner of my brush. I'm going to be putting in some nice big trees on this left hand side, but I need some foliage, what I call sort of sacrificial foliage. I'm going to be putting the tree trunks on top of them. So I just need some nice leafy shapes with some highlights. But I also take care not to extend this too far across to the centre of my painting. It'll interfere with that lovely reflection of the sunshine. So I make sure I stop short. Once again, you see, I'm texturing my canvas. I'm favouring the right hand corner of my brush a little more and dabbing. Here, it leaves a lovely textured surface upon which I can get some highlights to stick. This takes a little practice. Try not to paint them too stripy looking. Think about how you angle the brush, sweeping backwards and forwards. You'll also notice that I want to load my brush to do some bushes by dragging it through the paint in one direction. Rounded side first. The rounded side being the uncrimped edge of my brush. That side. Notice now that I've got that rounded side facing up. And I press into the canvas to leave a little imprint of the bristles. Don't let it creep across to the centre again. I think about doing one little bushy shape after another. This is what I call sort of the ugly phase of a painting when it's all a bit dark, but would we'll soon turn the highlights on. I've picked up a nice clean fresh one inch brush, not too worn mind. And I pull out my highlights and give a little push, favouring that right hand corner again. I want to load a lot of paint, but open up the bristles at the same time. Remember, a thin paint sticks to a thick paint. My highlights are thin and oily, and the dark green colour sticky and dry. I do one little branch at a time. But here's a tip. When you do that, you'll pick up a little dark. I just touch it onto a paper towel, so I don't transfer that colour back to my palette. And here once again, I swing my brush around in an arc to vary the angles. Bearing in mind where the light is, I want to highlight the right hand side more heavily and allow lots of dark shadows to exist in my painting. This helps my painting become more 3D, more realistic. For the bushes, I load my brush by pulling the brush one direction through the highlight colours, rounded side first. That's just a habit that reminds me which way I load my brush each time. This time, gently, just offer the brush to the canvas. The sticky dark colour will grab the paint from the bristles, so you don't have to push too hard. If you find yourself pushing harder, you either don't have enough paint on the brush, or it's not well loaded, or that the paint is too thick and won't stick to the dark underpaint. Those are the only reasons why this won't work. Here you see, I'm doing one little bush after another, gently, gently, gently touching, leaving a little imprint as I go, and saving some dark, of course. I'll tuck one more right on the end here. There. Time for some big trees. I like to use a brush to sort of work out where they're going to be, sort of give myself a bit of a clue. When I think I'm in the right position, I'll aim for a little dark patch here. That was a bit of luck, wasn't it? Now, use the point of the knife to scratch a line and stand back. If I don't like the position, I can always dab it out again. Now I've established the position for my happy little trees, it's time to mix up some dark colour for the trunk. Black and Van Dyke Brown. Mix together well, and take a little roll on the edge of your palette knife. Use the edge of the palette knife to create a nice textured surface. Bob would often say, when your paintings dry, if it feels like a tree trunk, it probably looks like a tree trunk, and it's true. Create some nice texture by tapping with the edge of the palette knife. 
I load the opposite side of the knife to do the left side of my tree trunk. On these really narrow tree trunks, I just slide my knife down and creates nice little grooves and texture. I want to add a few little branches. I've gone into some of my black and brown with a little drop of linseed oil. Use a liner brush and pull it to a very fine point. Now here's a top tip. Hold your brush right back at the end of the handle and think about the direction of these branches. Ones at the top of the tree are newer and they tend to grow more outwards and upwards. Branches in the middle of the trunk tend to grow more outward and not quite so high up. Branches that are a little older tend to droop down. But it's just a general idea, but you'll see it gets you a pretty nice tree all the same. If you enjoy my tutorials, don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit the little thumbs up button tells YouTube that I'm doing something you enjoy watching and they may share it to other people as well. It really helps my little channel to grow. If you want to go a little further, you can always drop a little donation in my coffee cup. I spend all the money on paint for new projects. Thank you. To highlight my trees, I want to use a marble mix. That's several colors partly mixed. Black, Van Dyke Brown, a little bit of Indian yellow, some grubby white, some dark sienna. A real mixture, but again, only partly mixed. I'll use my palette knife and pick up a little sample of the colour I want. The light coming strongly from the right, I want the brightest part of my tree trunk to be on the right. Here you see, I just take small rolls of paint and just touch the trunk. The sticky dark brown and black colour just takes the colour from my palette knife. I add a little and I stand back. As I go to the left of the tree trunk, I want my colour to be darker. I even switch to the short blade of my knife just to add a little sparkle. Here you see I'm adding a little pop of yellow. It really makes my trees stand out. Another little feature to add is referred light. This is a pale blue colour and Bob would use it often in his paintings. The pale blue light is referred back from other trees and bushes in the painting. It just sort of bounces back like a mirror. And here you see, it really makes the left hand side of my tree trunks stand away from the background trees and bushes. A small touch, but don't forget to add it to your own paintings. I want to add the suggestion of a little riverbank to my background land area. Maybe I should have done this before I did the foreground. It got a bit out of sequence, but as you see, I used a palette knife and just scrubbed in a little bit of the Van Dyke brown and black. I had a little touch of white. Again, this doesn't want to be too bright. Remember, the light is coming from behind the tree, so it should be a little more shadowy. I had a few sticks and twigs to finish off my painting. But maybe there's something else I can add. So here's my painting. A few days later and it's, well, sort of tacky, touch dry though. I think it's time for a bit of fiddling. I put out some titanium white and a touch of Indian yellow. I want to make a sort of soft golden colour. I want to enhance the misty area just below the sun. I think a finger works best for this sort of delicate operation. I'll rub it on and then smudge it in to make it fit into the painting. I'm taking great care to make sure that this is all in line. If it's slightly off, well, it won't work. I got a small fan brush. I take a touch of sap green into my Indian yellow white mixture. I want some bright little sparkly spots of flowers maybe, or little bits of dew sitting on the edge of the grass. These little extra touches a sparkle really add that little something special to your paintings. Make sure you spend a few minutes adding them to your own works. It'll be the difference between a lovely painting 
and a painting that, well, really shouts out quality. Here and there, I'll tap in a little more dark, just to bring the painting all together. With that, I think I have a finished painting. I'm going to call it Spring Mist, after the Bob Ross classic, Twilight Beauty. There's nothing like it. So there we have it. A lovely painting inspired by a Bob Ross classic, Twilight Beauty, even though they're nothing alike. And yes, the name Spring Mist, I think, has stuck. So next time you don't feel very inspired, watch one of my videos. It can definitely inspire you to do another painting. Happy painting, people. and Stay inspired. I was it inspired enough? It's inspiring, isn't it? I said it too many times, never mind. <laughs>